All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the final session. We're the lucky presenters right before the party. In fact, you know, I thought I'd just take a vote because Craig just graciously offered up, if you'd all rather go sit in the Renaissance bar and have a beer, Craig's buying. So how many wants to do that? I make, I make Canadian money. Oh. <laughs> So yeah, I those can, beers are I expensive can in there. That's only sure. afford Canadian beer, which which is better. Which is better? How is it two thirds of a beer? I don't. Know. <laughs> we'll all split one. We'll all split one. <laughs> we'll all split one. We'll all split split an Imperial IPA. <laughs> an Imperial. IPA. Anyway, we'll we'll get started. I think everybody is going to have to stay because Craig can't afford to buy us a beer. But, uh, so I'm Jeff Shaner, I'm the product manager for Workforce, and with me is Craig Gilgrass, he's the product owner for Workforce. Um, how many people that are here have used Workforce before? A couple of you. So we're gonna go over um, an overview of Workforce first, and we'll do a bunch of demos through it, um, and then we'll get to what's coming uh, near the end. So unfortunately, you're gonna have to stay near the end, but I don't think they're serving beer at the party yet until 6.30, so. Um, there's no point in going over there yet. Anyway, yeah. So, uh, you know, workforce for us, uh, what we've kind of thought about with workforce is really about uh, coordinating the field to office workflows. If you've looked at um, uh, some of the marketing material and the videos that we've been putting out about apps for the field. Um, recently it started with our users conference last year and we've been progressively talking about it. Uh, we're building on the concept of field operations where it starts with planning in the office. Uh, it's about the field to office collaboration, being able to communicate between uh, the field and office. Uh, workforce also provides that to-do list on your mobile device so that your field workforce has a list of the things that they need to do each day. Uh, and then also really important is the app integrations to all of our other mobile applications like Navigator to get to the location of the field work you need to do um, and Collector and Survey123 to complete the different types of work. Um, so Workforce has a back office component to it which we'll show and talk about and a mobile component that uh, helps you with that coordination, not just from the office to the field through the context of what we call work assignments, which we'll talk about later, but also peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So there is a way to uh, find other mobile workers uh, using the workforce application uh, and uh, contact them if you'd like, or get to their location. Uh, the mobile application is built uh, as an iOS application and an Android application. They're both in the uh, app stores now. The back office side of Workforce is a JavaScript web application and Craig will show you uh, in a couple of minutes here how you can actually go to workforce.arcgis.com, uh, sign in as a, we call a project owner and create something called a Workforce project. And then uh, using another role as a dispatcher, create and assign work for the mobile workers that use uh, the Workforce app. But I just wanted to kind of give you a few examples first of how people are using uh, Workforce today. And there's a, there's a few pictures up, um, but some of the workflows that we've seen, uh, a number in the uh, water vertical, uh, where they're doing things like hydrant maintenance, uh, for example, um, being able to, and that's actually uh, this very blurry screenshot here. Um, I don't know why it's so blurry on the on the projector. Um, where uh, the White House Utility District is actually looking at cross connections, and they need to annually go out and inspect um, where uh, connections cross because you you're looking for contamination in a water source. Um, in the picture in the middle, that's of a a mid-sized petroleum customer that um, what you're looking at specifically is a what they call a pigging operation. They send this pig down the pipeline to kind of clean it out um, and also uh, look at the residue because they can you know look at the maintenance of it. They actually use a combination of 
workforce and collector for everything in their organization that they do in the field. And that includes uh, inspecting valves, inspecting uh, road crossings, uh, right into um, the compressor station where gas is actually compressed before it's sold and all the maintenance work along that is all done with collector uh, driven through work assignments from workforce. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, uh, different applications of workforce that we, we've seen um, and uh, as we move forward uh, with the new developments that we've planned for workforce this year we're going to open it up to a whole uh, broad new audience uh, where they can take advantage of workforce. So Craig, I know you're busy on your phones here, but and I don't know how many you got. Doug had four devices for the collector um, session. I don't know if you're gonna up them with like five, but I no, only I've see only three. I've only got three, yeah. All right, so which, uh, which of the many switches would I'm you like? Three. yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, like Jeff said, I'm gonna take you through uh, workforce, talk a little bit about um, the different roles that you have with it that Jeff gave you a bit of an intro on. Um, and also some of the capabilities that you have. So um, what we're looking at here is uh, the Workforce web app. This is our JavaScript app uh, where both the project owner, um, who traditionally is the GIS administrator, it's the person responsible for managing the items within um, your portal, either an online or on-premise, uh, creating that content for the rest of your organization, uh, or your dispatchers and supervisors, the people who are responsible for actually creating work or assigning work, managing the workload is, that's assigned to their mobile workers. Um, Jeff gave a really good example of, um, I was only half paying attention because I was getting the demo <laughs> ready, of um, the gas pipeline example. I didn't talk about gas Help me out. What are you talking about? Bit. I never gave any examples. Was it the pipeline one? <laughs> this is a pipeline. This pipeline, okay. He gave a really good example of pipeline. <laughs> Um, that obviously resonated with everyone in the room but me. Yeah, apparently. Um, with a real world example, but I thought I'd change it up a little bit and, and show something that's a little different, a little unique. So I'm Canadian, as we established uh, when Jeff offered that I'd buy everyone drinks. Uh, so I work up in Canada, and, and one of the things that the city of Ottawa does where I work is they manage a lot of outdoor rinks. Um, so we've been talking to them about that kind of stuff, and, and they actually manage and, and you know, take care of those. So they've got this data layer available. So what I've got here is I've got, uh, for the city of Ottawa, I added um, a number of different layers that you have. And one of them is all of the outdoor rinks in the city of Ottawa. And there's actually a number of different tasks that they perform on this through the winter. Um, you need to get the boards up so that people don't go flying off into the snowbank, or the puck goes flying off and then somebody's gotta go get it. They've gotta take care of the lights, make sure that the lights work, because um, they work after dark a lot. Somebody's gotta shovel the rink or in the really nice areas, they have an outdoor Zamboni machine to what? clean it for really? you. Yeah, it's true, it's crazy. Wow. I know. Not where I live though. So you gotta shovel it. They also need to open up that shack, right? Because it's, nothing's better than changing skates when it's minus 30 out. So they have shacks set up. So somebody's gotta be responsible for making sure that they're cleaned and open. So those are all different types of work that someone needs to coordinate or assign to people in the field who can go and take care of it. So it's a bit of a different idea, right? I mean, you know, are they assigning this work to people out in the field in the neighborhood to do this? But probably not, but you could do this type of thing, right? So it's meant to show that there's lots of different examples where you can look at an application like Workforce being useful, where you've got people responsible for coordinating work and getting it out to people in the field so they can know what they have to do, where to do it, and the priority of it. So what we're looking at here is the Workforce Web application, like I mentioned, and I've got a number of different layers in my map, like those outdoor rinks that I just showed, all across the city of Ottawa. There's a couple other things that I've got here as well as the person who's responsible for coordinating the management of these rinks. Down the left-hand side of the screen, maybe you guys can see, I don't know if that pillar's in the way, okay. Down the left-hand side of the screen, you can see I get a list of the work that needs to be done, okay? So, I've got a little bit of information about each thing. I've got what type of work needs to be done. In this case, it's checking the lights, where that location is. Okay? In this case, it's the park that the rink is located at. I can also give it a priority when that needs to be due. I can also see when it was created and also some other information about it, like add some description to it or attach data. So I get a really succinct and simple description of the work that needs to be done. 
Just like if I was talking to the person responsible for managing this rink and taking care of it. Like, hey, you need to go check the lights. It's at this rink. Here's where it sits in your priority list and here's when I expect you to be done. So when we put together Workforce, we talked to a lot of different users who were doing work management like this and we tried to come up with this common scheme, this common language that they talked about, about the work that had to be done. And this is where we came up with these properties for the different work assignments was based on that discussion. So down the left hand side, we provide you with this list of the work that you're going to work on. And um, on the right, we have a map to show you the context with everything else. So you can see that I have an outline of the park and I've got a nice vector base map in behind it as well. Um, and then I've actually got the rink as well underneath that assignment. This looks a lot like, if you ignore the map for a second, a little bit like an Excel spreadsheet in a way. You've got line items for the list of work that you need to do. When we talked to a lot of people for the dispatchers, the people coordinating this work, they were very list driven and list oriented. Whether it was an Excel spreadsheet or some other software that they were using for this management, they always thought about it in, I've got a list of work that I need to get to to assign to people. We wanted to introduce the map idea to them as well so they could see the context of where those assignments are occurring with all their other layers, but also keep that really strong requirement that we heard of adding the list. So that's how we married the two together so that they still have the comfort, the familiarity of seeing the list of work down the left hand side here, but we're also introducing the ability to see it in a slightly different way to be able to see where those assignments are on the map. Now there's other things that I can see on the map as well. It's not just the work assignments that you're interested in, but you're also interested in where the workers are who are going to be performing that work, okay? So I can go and take a look at where one of those workers are uh, currently located on my map. And if I zoom out, so we start to pull in some of the other data, you'll see that I can also see the assignments, such as this one in green. There's one down here in gray at about five o'clock. And I've also got a cluster of other assignments here as well that I can see. So not only am I presented with the work that needs to be done, the operational or asset layers that I'm interested in, I'm also presented with my workers and where they are. So I can see, just by looking at the map in a very visual way, possibly who the most ideal person is to take care of that work. Okay? So we're trying to bring those different concepts together. Now, if I scroll down here a little bit, you'll see that I've got a couple other different workers down here, um, including Jeff on the right, who's clearly not working because he's not set up yet to go. What we heard when we were talking to users was that it was very important not just to see where their workers are, but what their status is. Are they currently working and available for work to come in? Or are they off not working right now? Are they done for the day? Are they on break? Right? So they're taking their 15 minute break. Maybe they've headed over to Starbucks to grab a coffee. They're not working right now, but they can get to it soon. So that as a dispatcher, if you need someone who, to take care of job immediately, you can see whether those workers are available and online. So we've broken them out into different statuses. Okay? So not just the worker location and their name and other information about their job title, but also what their working status is and if they're available to work. So we tried to bring this all together into a single web application available for those dispatchers in the back office to be able to see that. So that's the basic layout of Workforce and everything that's there in the web application. Um, what we also heard though is that it's really powerful and useful to be able to narrow down the work that your workers are performing. And we provide a couple different ways for you to do that. Um, there's a lot of common fields that you want to sort on. A lot of times from dispatchers, we heard they come into work at the beginning of the day, and what they actually need to look at is all of the unassigned work that they have. They don't need to look at the work that was assigned or completed the day before. A lot of times, the very first thing they do is, what's the work that's not assigned to anybody that I need to get into people's hands? So that's what I've done here. I've actually gone and filtered all of the different work assignments that I have, and I'm only looking at those work assignments that are currently not assigned to anyone. So really quickly and easily, I'm able to narrow down my view and my list. And if I clear the filter, you'll see that I had 59 assignments up here. And you'll notice that I've got a number of different clusters. And when I set that unassigned status to it, you'll see that now it's down to 40 in the list. And the map is also reflecting it as well. So we're keeping that common theme of allowing to tailor your list to see 
the type of work that you're interested in doing, in this case, based on assignment, uh, based on the status, but also have that reflected on the map, right? So that you can see the worker's location as well as the work that they need to be done. So we've got a number of different filters that you can apply here, um, like the status, when the work is due, the priority, uh, who it's assigned to as well. Um, we also allow you to sort the work in several different ways. We default to just sorting on status, but I can also sort based on highest priority. So I can start to build up a view of the system, the way that I'd like to look at these assignments by filtering down to which ones I'm interested in and then sorting them so that in this case, the highest priority work can come out on the top. Uh, so let me clear that out. And uh, let's see, what are the other? Well, I'll come back to that filter. There's a filter up on the top there, right, where you can see by filter, type, location, or ID, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, one of the other things that we heard was that, in general, you can characterize the work that, that people are doing in the field in two really broad ways. There's planned and unplanned work. Uh, this is probably a really good example of the planned work. Someone's already made a decision that this work needs to be done. Um, certain boards need to be removed from rinks, lights need to be checked, shacks need to be open. Someone's made that decision the work has to be done and it's been entered into workforce. But another good example is the unplanned work. The dispatcher gets a call. Hey, there's a problem. We've got a report that the lights are out. Somebody needs to go check it right away. So there's a couple different ways they can do that, right? They might be notified that um, uh, based on um, the asset ID of the particular asset that they're interested in, uh, but they also might actually have an address or a location for what they're looking for. So I could go in and actually look for a location here in Ottawa, find that really quickly, and you can see that I've also got my rink right here, and this could be the rink where the lights are actually out of commission, where it needs to be handled. So this is a good idea of an assignment where I need to create some unscheduled work because I've got a report that somebody needs to go and take care of these lights. So now that I've got this rink selected, I can go and create an assignment here and actually determine who should go take care of the work. So I'll go and pick the type of work that needs to be done. In this case, they need to check the lights. You can see that my location is already populated here. And the way that this location is being populated is based on the pop-up configuration that I've set up for that outdoor rinks layer that I added to my map. So based on the title of the pop-up config, that's how we're generating the location that you want to tell your workers to go, because it depends. You might want to use the address of that rink, you might want to have a cross street, or you might want to use an asset ID. So you can have some configuration options to change that. Uh, I can also choose who to assign it to. Uh, in this case, I'm going to assign it to Caroline. Um, and now visually, it's really easy to see she's right there, right? I mean, obviously, it's a little contrived demo because she's right next to it. But I don't know if you can notice it. It's a it's little smallness on, based on the resolution I have. But underneath her, you can see the distance. She's 371 feet away. So we also give you that ability, right? So the ability to see whether someone is working and available for status, which they are because she's set to working. But I can also see how far she is from the assignment, right? So we're giving that straight line distance to the assignment to be able to give you a rough guide about who should probably take care of it. Uh, I'll set a priority to be high, uh, the due date I'll do today. Um, I could enter in a description, but I don't know about that. But I can enter in an ID, and this is the one that I really want to focus on. Um, I talked about the two different types of work, planned and unplanned. When we also talked to a lot, of, a lot of you out there when we were building workforce, and still when we talked to you, <coughs> the common theme that came out was that, yes, you talk about where the work needs to be done and what type of work needs to be done, but there's always some sort of identifier that follows that work around. It could be a work order ID, it could be a job number, um, it could be an asset ID. There's some sort of identifier that you use within your organization to follow that work. That's what this field is for. We don't set it for you. It's just a text field and you can put in here whatever you like. I could just start typing that in. That's a pretty bad ID, but hey, that's my ID, right? Uh, or I could go and enter just a really simple one like one, two, three, four, five. Um, to populate this in. One thing we heard was that a lot of people do is these calls come in, they actually might have a 311 system that it's integrated with. So if they still have paper orders coming in, they can easily type that in. Um, obviously that's not ideal and there's other ways that you can do to populate this, which we'll get to um, in a little bit when I talk about uh, loading assignments into workforce. But the main idea is that we've created this schema to be flexible for you to use it 
for your own purposes. And in this case, to add an ID so that I can track this work as it goes through. Uh, so I'll go and create that assignment and it's all set and you can see that it's assigned to Caroline so she could go and take care of that work. Uh, and if I head back to the assignment list, if I was then going to go and filter on the assignments, I can filter on one, two, three, four, five, and you see I can get to that, that ID really quickly. So the other thing we heard was that these IDs, these service numbers that you're using, these job numbers are things that you need to talk about and communicate with each other. A lot of time you'll have a worker in the field who says, listen, I'm, I'm here at service request uh, four, five, six, and, and nobody's here. And that's all they know, right, is four, five, six. Well, what's the easiest way to find it? You filter on ID 456, you can get to that assignment and get some information about it to figure out what to do, okay? So the main thing is that a lot of the different concepts that we brought in with Workforce were based on discussions we had with users about how they manage work within their organization, and we built those into both um, the web and the mobile app. Uh, so I think that's all I'm gonna talk about for the web app for now. I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff so he can talk about some stuff and it's gonna come back to me in a bit to talk about the mobile app and some other things. All right, that was an intro demo, jeez. <laughs> Usually those are quick, but well, you're pounding I could have got a beer and came back. You were pounding your Mac so hard because it froze. I, had I know, to give you time. I was able to reboot my Mac in the time that you were doing. Yeah. I could have done it two or three times. Oh yeah, I gotta switch over. So, oh, look at that, this even looks a little odd. All right, so, um, you know, Craig did that wonderful demo that I was half listening to because I was rebooting my Mac. But he walked you through kind of the dispatcher's view of, um, what we refer to the, the role as, the dispatcher's view of workforce uh, within that web application. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the other role, which is that, um, uh, you know, really the, the creation and planning of work uh, that has to happen. And you can think a bit about that as the dispatcher, um, but quite often, uh, you know, you see different forms of work management come into the system. Um, it might even be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be founded with a work order management system. Uh, what we say is workforce is not a work order management system, but it's a way to fuse work into the ArcGIS platform. And a part of that is uh, really ETLing uh, work into the ArcGIS system. And we'll get to a slide where we uh, kind of open up and look at the schema of what we call a workforce project as well. Um, so one way to think about, as Craig mentioned, the planned versus unplanned work is planned work could be um, loaded into uh, workforce uh, from one or more different systems. We provide some Python scripts that can help you if it's coming from an external work management system. Um, but you could even use ArcGIS Pro if you wanted to. Uh, we document the rules at which you can create your work assignments um, uh, through other means than the, than the dispatching capability in the web application. Um, and then you can assign that work and use the mobile work uh, mobile application to to kind of um, go off and complete it. Um, the administration of the workforce project, you can think about it, it's all centered around using um, the workforce website. So in there you can create one or more workforce projects within your organization and you can configure the different types of assignment um, like the check the lights being one of them as part of the definition of that project. It's also where you add in the already pre-defined um, named users that become either dispatcher roles or mobile worker roles within the organization and within the workforce project. Uh, and with uh, both of those roles, you can add additional metadata like their uh, contact number or their job title and some notes about them. Um, in that um, configuration of the project, you can also um, add map layers to the workforce dispatching uh, web map that Craig showed you, as well as the mobile workers map. There are two separate web maps that you can add content into. It's also where you configure the integration with the apps as well. Um, so. You know, a lot of content gets created, so we wanted to simplify that process by giving you this administrative workflow 
um, within the workforce web application. Um, Craig went through this in excruciating detail, so we don't need to uh, highlight too much of it. Uh, just that you can obviously use the filtering capabilities in a lot of different ways, as, Chris, as uh, Craig showed you. Um, you can also look to assign and uh, reassign work uh, in bulk if you want. And you can use other layers you add into the map to help you in the creation of assignments. So um, though the assignments are actually a point geometry type, uh, you could have uh, lines or areas within the map and you can select those and generate work assignments um, from them. So just uh, something, something to note. Um, the work assignment itself, the anatomy of it, uh, there is a life cycle to a work assignment referred to in the states there. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk about that in more detail if you're interested. An important aspect of the state is that uh, it also has date timestamps of when uh, you start a work assignment, when you complete it. Uh, and with the scripts that we have to automate the creation of work, uh, you can also uh, get at some scripts to do some interesting analysis of the assignments based upon leveraging the, the date timestamp and, um, and location as well. Um, there's different properties to it as uh, Craig already talked about. There is the status, there is the, the due date and due time which I need to add into the slide here uh, which you didn't fill out in, in your work assignment you created. Uh, priority, the assignee, uh, the different types um, and obviously priority is a big aspect to it. Um, critical is an interesting one because critical requires acknowledgement by the mobile worker. So you really want to, it's like that really annoying read receipt, but in the case of uh, workforce, you have uh, no possibility to ignore it. You have to. Has anybody worked with Jeff Shaner? <laughs> <laughs> they never get a read receipt from him because he never checks his email. Yes, he does. No! That's See, just a bot he set hey, up. Hey. That's an intern he hired <laughs> to take care of that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Craig. <laughs> um, and uh, you can also attach information to the work assignment. So, you know, if there's an actual structure to the way that the work assignment needs to be completed, because it's a fairly complicated workflow, um, you, can you can attach that directly to it or photos to it if that's important as well. Uh, the workers, it's another important concept um, in workforce. You know, we've talked about that there are two prime, well, three roles, the administrator, the project manager that creates the workforce project, and the dispatcher that can create and assign work, um, and the mobile worker that completes it, right? Um, the mobile worker has additional details like their contact number, uh, and both the web application as well as the mobile application can take advantage of that. So you could search for a mobile worker uh, in the web app and use like if you've got Skype integration uh, like we all do at work, uh, you could directly call um, from uh, your computer to that mobile worker and say, you know, Craig, why are you sitting at the Renaissance bar when you're supposed to be at the hockey rink checking lights? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, the bar is so, right there. Yeah, there is a bar, there is a bar but right there's there. yeah. no reason to be at that one because there's no <laughs> alcohol. Sure, go ahead. Well, how do you know where that person's located? Um, well, are tracking them? So we're storing their last known location, and um, you'll see, and, and that's at a given uh, frequency in which we capture the location and send it back into a feature service. And when Craig was showing you Caroline, um, on there, that was her last known location. So we'll always update that. But and by the phones, GPS. By the phones, well, by location that comes to the location service, uh, that could be from the phone or it could be from another. Like we talked in collector, you know, that could be an external receiver if you want to get a little more accurate. Uh, but yes, we do it there. And then optionally, in the administration of the workforce project, you can turn on the ability to log location history. So if you want to know where Craig has been, in addition to where he is, we'll store that for you if you want. Yeah. And we do that based upon uh, the different states. Uh, so if I change my status to not working, 
we're no longer going to capture that breadcrumb trail because we don't care anymore because he's not actually working. Um, so uh, here goes the big demo. I am going to go get a beer this time. <laughs> Which one do you want? The three, three. again? Three. Uh, so uh, I'll touch on a couple different things um, for for what's next. So this is the what's new session. Uh, but to a bunch of you, it's totally new. So, but I'll still show some new stuff from last year. Uh, so one of the things we heard was, uh, hey, can you make it easier for me to f see the workers in the map? When we went to visit some sites, people were saying it was, it was a little tricky for them to relate the worker list with where the workers were on the map. Um, so our designers and developers got together and, and figured out a couple things. Um, so they, they added the ability to actually um, when you float over them, they'll pop up to be able to see where they are, right? Can we get it? Yeah? All right? Yeah. The developers in the room, I won't point them out, so it's appreciated. Uh, tips are accepted as well, just not, not in Canadian. Uh, the other thing that, so we've got this great clustering set. Was, uh, was, there, was anybody not at the plenary? Right answer. Okay, so. Uh, Eric Ito showed in our top 10 the clustering that we've got here, which is what you see on screen. He did a really nice job describing what it is, so I, I won't go into that too much. Uh, clustering is great when you've got lots of features in a really small area, like he said, and you've got to figure it out. But we did hear some use cases where you wanted to disable clustering for a few reasons. One is, you know what, I, I just I don't have so many features, so many assignments, that it needs to be clustered. Um, so we give the ability to toggle on and off here. Um, so you can really quickly and easily just see where those locations are if you need to narrow into something and then turn it back on. Um, it is enabled by default though, so it is one of those things that you can turn off. And we persist that per project, um, per browser on the machine. So if you s disable clustering for a project, you come back in the next day, it'll still be there in that browser for the dispatcher. Um, so just a couple things in, in the web app that we added new. Um, but what I'd also like to, to dive into is talk a little bit about what, what Jeff was talking about before. Um, and go into a little bit of detail on uh, the interaction of assigning some work and giving it to your workers on the device. So uh, I'm gonna go and zoom in here to, to downtown Ottawa and uh, where evidently I am right now um, and actually go and select a particular assignment that's there that I need to get taken care of. Uh, and I'm gonna go and assign that to myself. There we go, it's all set. So we're ready to go. So I've gone and assigned myself that work that I need to go and take care of removing some boards. Um, but I'm going to jump over here to the mobile app uh, and just take a quick look at it. So what I've got here is just my iPhone 7 that I've got running hooked up. And you can see that um, I'm looking at the mobile worker view of Workforce right now. So there's a couple things I just want to highlight. You'll see that notification up at the very top there, one assignment added. That's the assignment I just assigned to myself uh, and it just went away. So it stays for about 60 seconds so the worker can see it when they're in the app and see that information. But you can see there's a lot of things that are shared in common with the dispatcher sees. You get that list of information, your to-do list for the day for the workers. That was a theme that we heard about quite a bit. It was very important for the workers to be able to see what work they've got to do today. What's on their immediate list that they're taking a look at. So a lot of similarities with the dispatcher looking at that mobile work as well. Um, the worker needs to be able to actually change their status, right? So whether I'm working like I am right now or whether I'm on a break uh, or not working at all. I could also go in here and choose to sort my list, very similar to what I have available to me um, in the web map as well, so that right now it's sorted um, by priority by default. Um, you can see I've got a little bit of information in the list, but um, because I'm on the phone and I'm on a small form factor here, the list is what's displayed but if I open up one of these assignments, you'll see that I get some information about it. So I have the information about what type of work needs to be done. You can see I've got a little inset map there as well. And if I pull down, it's not just a photo, but it's actually the map itself. So I can get access to it and see a little bit more information about where I need to do work. I can see how far I am from it. Um, I could go and, and choose to, um, to tap some notes on it. But because this is a critical assignment, like Jeff mentioned, I first have to acknowledge that I've actually received it before I can start working with it. What that acknowledgement is, is when we were talking to sites, we heard a lot of times that the dispatcher and worker, there's this communication that happens when they call them on the radios or they text or send email that, yes, I got it and I'll take care of that. That's what that acknowledgement is. 
And the dispatcher in the central office looking at the workforce web application can see when it's been acknowledged. That's actually a property that you'll see and you'll see that the assignment changes a little bit. So they can see that they've actually acknowledged it and the worker's saying, yep, I can take that, I'm gonna work on it, and I've got it. Is replacing the boards an example of something that's critical? Probably not. But if you've got a sewer pipe that's ruptured, that's probably a good example of something that's critical and needs to be handled, right? Or I guess depending on the size of the pothole in your city, if it's a pothole that needs to be filled. But there's lots of really good examples of where this, this critical nature comes in. Do you have to use critical priorities? No, it's just one of the options that are available there for you to do that and recognize that the workers have to acknowledge it. Um, so now that I've acknowledged it, I can add some notes to it, like uh, this is a note. Uh, that I'll add and save that. So the notes idea, when we talked to a lot of sites, they brought out their paper service requests or work orders to us. And there was, a, there was a bunch of things they had in common and that's what created an assignment. But one of the really interesting things that they had in common is that every single paper work assignment has this big area called write stuff here. It could be called notes, comments, uh, whatever it might be, right? It's just a big area where the worker's gotta enter some information that they can communicate back to the central office as that work order goes through. That's what the notes field is for, okay? So it's for the worker to communicate to the dispatcher, not to have a back and forth communication, okay? That back and forth communication is for the dispatcher to get new assignments to that worker, update descriptions. The notes is really for that worker to get information to that central dispatcher. Uh, so once I've opened and acknowledged that assignment, I could go and work on that, but instead of that one, uh, let's go and take a look at the one that I just assigned to myself. There we go. I'll kind of zoom around here a little bit. That's the one. So that's the replace the boards that I just assigned myself to set up. So um, in this example, I gave this work uh, to the worker in the field to do some, uh, to go and replace the boards here. So now they're gonna go and choose to do the work, right? So what's the flow that they would do? Well, um, the very first thing they need to do is actually get from their location to where this work assignment is. Now, I could choose to just drive there and figure out how to get there, but one way I could do it is actually use our apps to integrate together, like Navigator, to actually get the directions from where I am to the assignment that I need to do the work on. So what I did there was I tapped the overflow button to navigate to the assignment. It took the location of where I am in down, downtown Ottawa for now, we'll just assume that's where I am, and the assignment of where I need to get to. It took those two locations, passed it to Navigator and said, give me the best route to get between those two and then let the worker start routing to it. So it's a really simple and quick way for the worker to be able to get directions from where they are to where they're going. Now once they arrive at where they're going, I'm clearly there. We now prompt the worker, you're at this location, do you want to return to workforce? In which case I can. And now that I'm back in workforce, I can actually go and start my work. Now when I did that, hopefully you'll notice up here, the symbology, the color of this icon, this assignment changed. It was gray, it's now green. I've now indicated to the dispatcher that I'm starting this work. If you don't have systems like this in, in place today, how does that information get communicated? The dispatcher has to somehow contact on a phone, right, a two-way radio, um, you might be using collector for this type of work as well. We do have people who are doing that now where they have a collector web map up and they look for the point to show up. Okay, great, they just collected something. They're on site working, right? Now with just a single tap of the button, I'm able to communicate to that central office that I've started work here. It's a really simple, powerful concept, but it's really resonating with a lot of people who've, who need to see that communication, need to see that the work is happening and going on, okay? So now that I'm at the boards and um, I'm at the rink and I've started my work, um, I could take down those boards, but I also might need to collect other information with it as well. So just like with Navigator, I called out and opened up Navigator to get a route, I can go to Collector and actually open up a specific web map to collect some information at that spot. So I'm doing like outdoor board replacement, so that's a bit of a stretch, but what are some other examples of this? You might be doing inspections, Right, like the pipeline inspections that Jeff talked about before. Maybe you're using Survey123 for that, okay? The main point is that Workforce works well with all of the other apps, right? 
whether it's Navigator, to, and clearly my hockey team is starting a game quite soon. I don't know why Do Not Disturb doesn't stop those from coming up. <clears throat> yeah. So um, it works well with all the other apps, like Navigator, like I showed, like Collector, also as well, right? Um, I could also call it to Survey123. Now, the interesting thing about here is that it's actually dropped a pin at the location of where the work is going to be done. Right? Not my location, but the location of where I have to collect it. So I could go in here and choose to collect, uh, in this case, it's just a new rink, and then go and submit that. So a really simple example of being able to call from workforce out to data collection, in this case, collector, could also be survey123, open up a specific web map, and start collecting information. Now I just submitted that edit really quickly, right? What didn't pop up? Back to work, right? Why didn't it? We don't know if you're done. How many things are you collecting there? Are you editing other data? We don't know, right? So with Navigator, we've got this really well-defined stop point when you get to that stop point, right? We know we can prompt you to return to workforce. With Collector and Survey123, we don't have that as much, right? We don't want to keep, hey, do you want to go back? Hey, do you want to go back? Are you sure? Hey. Right? So we're really looking for feedback on what you would like with this, right? And specifically what your workers would like. Um, right now we've kept it really loose. So, you know, with a lot of people who are familiar with the platforms, whether it be iOS or Android, you know, in, in um, iOS I could, you know, hit the home button and go back, or I've got my back button up here to return me to workforce. In Android I can do the same thing, right? I can shuffle through the apps and get back to workforce. That's worked for a lot of people, but we're really interested in your feedback if that works for everything. Um, now that I'm back here, I'll click finish. And now that it's done, it returns me to my list, and then I can move on to the next thing, the next assignment that I'd like to do. Um, but that's the comprehensive demo. I've still got like two more demos to show. Two? I know, got sorry. two? I'm gonna pass it back to Jeff, who's um, either deleting slides or adding <coughs> new ones based on how much time we have left. I am definitely deleting slides. Yeah. And I know that there was a couple questions, but I'm just gonna say hold them, because we're available after to handle those questions. Jeff is anyway. <laughs> He's gonna pull that beer out of his Yeah. <laughs> oh geez. <laughs> so I just I called it down to one slide to kind of go over what the workforce project anatomy is. Um, and are you gonna do an administrative? Yeah. Okay, you're that. gonna create a project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Effectively, this is all the stuff that gets created. We document. Because Craig used to work on the geodatabase team, he wanted to create a UML document, but we wouldn't let him go that far. Um, so, you know, project item, the maps, a bunch of feature services, we put it in a folder for the person who creates it and then share it in a group and we add all those named users that are the users into that group so that they can get access to it. Do I need to pass it back to you for no, a demo again? Not yet, no. Because I'm going to jump into what's new and then you can just kind of roll with the what's new and your Okay, bring it back to me. Yep. Oh. Okay, back to Craig. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, Jeff showed that the schema creation uh, really quick. Oh, I wanted to talk about the last role that we have in workforce. We, we leave this one till the end because, um, uh, you know, well, for a lot of us who are GIS administrators or we manage portals, we manage information, very few people's business, at least I hope people's business cards don't say this, uh, my job is feature service creator, right? I manage items for everybody. That's a task you perform to get to the rest of the work you need to do. You're enabling people in your organization to head out into the field, create maps, do data, that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's sort of one step along it. With Workforce, we wanted to take a different position on it. Um, Jeff showed the schema diagram that we had there. With Workforce, we create a number of items in, in the background in your organization, which I'll show in a second. Um, but we didn't want you to have to do all that manually. We wanted to create a streamlined experience for you. So uh, in this case, I'm gonna go and create a project. I'll just create a real simple name here. Dev Summit Demo. Um, this is my demo project. And then I'll hit Create. So what this is doing for you is it's going and creating those four feature services that Jeff talked about, the two web maps. It's putting them in a folder, creating in a group, sharing them with that group, and also creating the workforce project item that it needs. 
If you were to do that manually, it would take you like half an hour because I've done it manually more than anybody and it takes me like half an hour to do it and half the time I made a mistake, right? So if you had to create all those feature services and web maps yourselves, let's be honest, you wouldn't use Workforce. The barrier to get going would be too much. So I was able to really quickly and easily go and create these and if I, I jump out to my organization here and go and take a look at, at the content um, and we go and look at the folders, you'll see here's that folder that I just created and it's got the four feature services for me. It's got the web maps, the workforce projects up at the top, the groups ready. I'm ready to go. It's created a bunch of items for me in online in my organization and I'm all set and ready to start working with it. So what's the next thing that I need to do? Well, the project setup hint here at the top tells me there's a couple of things I need to do. The very first thing is you have to talk about the type of work that you're doing in this project. And that's a theme we've been talking about um, throughout the presentation. Um, so I'll do, uh, let's see, technical uh, workshop. And I'll say uh, something else is uh, drink beer at party. And I guess we have these wristbands and we signed that waiver to ride the carnival ride. Dodgeball, maybe. Uh, uh, I will not be doing that. My wife does not allow me to play dodgeball here anymore <laughs> after uh, the incident of 2011. Um, uh. So the next thing that we have to do is actually define who participates in this project, okay? Um, <clears throat> right away, you'll see there's somebody there already. It's, it's me, the person who's created the project, right? In this case, the project owner, the GIS administrator. I'm added as a dispatcher to it right away, and you can see in brackets it shows me as the owner. Um, I also can't remove myself from it, so it currently shows that I'm active, so I can't be removed from it. The reason we did this was so that you could take it for a test drive. A lot of times, and we hear about this with prototyping especially, when you create the projects and you try to divvy up what type of work is done within each, it's rare when you get it right the first time. You want to create the project, see if it makes sense for the type of work you're doing and who's performing that work in the project, and see if it makes a lot of sense for how you want to break it up. So we add the project owner as a dispatcher so you can take workforce for a test spin once you've set it up and make sure that it works before you unleash it on your organization. Um, if you want to get access to those work order or those work assignments like I had before, uh, you just need to go and add yourself as a mobile worker, and now I can use workforce in all three roles. Okay? Uh, but I can also go in here and add, let's see, I'll go and add Shaner, make him a worker. So that's great. Uh, but in a lot of organizations, you not only have people within your organization collaborating and working on projects, you also have people outside organizations. Maybe they're contractors that you've hired and they already have an ArcGIS Online named user and you need to add them. So just like you can with online, you can search for users that are outside of your organization and add them to your project. You can see that down below, it's indicated that I've been invited to that project. It's super fast, the notification. But what it said is that you've been added to the project um, and you're just waiting for the worker to confirm. So we're using the same infrastructure that ArcGIS Online uses. How many people have invited somebody to a group from another organization, right? Raise them high. Yeah, there you go. Be proud about that. Um, when you do that, you have the option to either invite them and then they can respond, or you can, um, uh, you have to wait for them to actually agree to it so you don't get deluged all the groups. We're doing the same thing here, right? So we're using that infrastructure that's in online, just like we're using the web maps and the feature services to add this extra capability to workforce to make it easier for you to work with it. Uh, so the very last thing that I can do is actually go in here and either configure uh, like the question before about how you know where workers have been. Jeff talked about we always write the worker's last known location. You can also configure their location tracks or where they have been, so the breadcrumbs of it. By default, we do not enable this on projects, but you can actually go and enable this and then go and configure exactly which time you'd like it to be. In this case, I'll make it five minutes. So what I've just done here is I've said, every five minutes, write that worker's location to my tracks or my breadcrumbs feature service so I can see where they've been, right? So you can see that trail as they've been going around throughout the day. So you've got that in here for Jeff, right? It, we don't turn it <laughs> off for Jeff. It's always on because we don't trust this guy <sighs> with stuff. The other thing that you can do, so I showed the integration between the different apps and workforce. 
projects come integrated with Navigator by default. Okay? So if you're using Navigator uh, for your mobile apps, your workers can route to those assignments if they have an MMPK or a web map on their Navigator device. If you're not using Navigator, there's no cost to this, right? You could choose to remove it um, or you could, you could just leave it as is. If Navigator's not on the device, you won't be given the option to navigate to it. Okay? So we control it at two levels, one at the project and also what's, if it's on the device. Uh, but I could also choose to go in, and add an integration uh, for collector like I did before. So I can actually go in here and choose to add one for, um, in this case we'll do the, this one here, and set up the integration with it. This is how when I was working with the mobile app, I set it up where I was at the assignment and I said launch collector and collect a point at that location. Workforce Mobile knew to do that because I'd already gone in and set this up for that particular project. Okay? So you can go in and pair up the information about which web map or which survey form you need to open for that particular, um, that particular assignment type that you're working on. So I've gone and configured everything and I'm all set to go. I could choose to open this project and start working with it right away. It's kind of cool. But the last thing that I want to mention here is um, I just clicked on, we got two links down there called the dispatcher map and the worker map that Jeff mentioned. These are those two maps that were added. Um, we're using the ArcGIS Online Embedded Map Viewer within the Workforce Web Application. So when you're configuring this, you can do everything that you need to do right within the web application. I can go in here and change my base map. I can go and search for other maps within my organization, other layers, and add them within it. So I can configure everything I need right within uh, the back office web app. Uh, so that's the configuration and project setup for everything and talking a little bit about the schema. Um, if you're interested in loading data or loading assignments in that are pre-planned, like I talked about earlier, um, one of the ways we recommend people to do this and we see more and more people using it is by using Python to script the loading of those assignments. We had a session yesterday that highlighted um, our workforce-scripts repo uh, that's available on GitHub that has access to all those different Python scripts that show you how to be able to take, for example, CSV files and load those work assignments into your workforce projects. Um, that's generally the way that we recommend you do that pre-planned loading of data. And that way you can easily script it and load it in. Um, that's all available as an FAQ, which I can point people to afterwards um, for the session. But I'm going to pass it over to Jeff, who's going to talk about what's really new. What's coming next. What's coming next in Workforce. Yep, and I'll be quick because you have one more demo. I and we're one more demo, yes. uh, seven minutes from beer o'clock. Um, so we have a release that's planned uh, for early April, and uh, there's a couple of important things coming. One is a standalone uh, installer uh, for the back office web application uh, so that you can use it with ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5. And what that'll mean is that you can install the web application onto your portal instance, uh, and then we'll write the content, uh, those maps, those feature services, to the hosted data store, the ArcGIS data store. Now again, you can leverage the GIS server and add your asset layers in there just as you do with ArcGIS Online. Um, one important point to note is that it will require a server uh, patch as well. Uh, so, but that'll all be rolled up and documented um, if you're interested in getting the setup. The other thing is uh, improving the app integrations. So um, you saw just a few minutes ago with Craig where he uh, created the um, app integration for Collector, uh, but that's at the project level. And one, one of the things we've heard a lot about is being able to uh, deepen that level of app integration to the assignment type. Um, and so here's just an example of assignment types, you know, like maybe there's a one call ticket or a road crossing inspection or a valve inspection. Um, and today what you'd have to do is you'd have to have one collector web map with a one call layer and a road crossings layer inside of it. Uh, and you could only have one uh, survey form. And so if you had valve inspections and say compressor readings, then uh, you're kind of having to lump those together into one survey form, which is not ideal. So when we were done, uh, and I think this is the demo that Craig's going to show, uh, is then uh, you could actually have um, the collector web map for each uh, individual assignment type or a survey form for each individual assignment type. Um, and then I'll just do one more slide before I get that back to you because I might not be able to come back. Uh, there's 
a bucket list of other things that we want to do later this year um, that are around this theme of efficiency. Uh, so that includes on the client side and the mobile application being able to attach photos kind of as a validation that that work assignment has been done or for whatever reason the work assignment couldn't be completed. Uh, adding offline support so that if you're in a, an area where you have no connectivity then you can still um, create or sorry not create but uh, finish work assignments. Today we have a low connectivity mode but it, you, and you get your to-do list if you lost connectivity but we have we want an explicit uh, capability to take it offline. Even further deepen the app integration so that you can pass information between uh, the work assignment uh, to the other mobile application like the work ID uh, be able to pass that over as a pre uh value to a, a new point you collect in collector or, or into your survey form. Being able to pull work um, that uh, is sitting and unassigned because uh, you've actually completed all your work for the day and you still have an hour left so grab stuff that's unassigned. Uh, and also supporting kind of these user-defined fields that, um, you know, one example would be uh, I want to be able to uh, note the cost associated with completing this work assignment. So I have a, a cost field that I've added into the work assignments layer. Let me populate that so show it in the mobile application. So the what's new demo back to you. Uh, okay, so um so I'm going to just demo a couple of the things the team's been working on. Uh, one thing is uh, we've been working really hard on uh, support for Enterprise 10.5. Uh, I'm not going to show that here, but it's coming along really well. The team's really been putting their heads down and getting that work done, and it's going to be available uh, towards the end of the month, early April. Um, so for those of you interested uh, on using Workforce uh, on-premise uh, in Enterprise 10.5, take a look for that. Um, you'll see one of Jeff's uh, famous blog posts that'll be available with lots of witty banter in it to be able to talk about it. But the other items that I want to focus on are um, uh, the concept Jeff talked about of, of pushing the work down to the assignment type level. He talked about the inspections and that's a great example. This was a use case we heard pretty early on. If you've got a project for different types of inspections that you're performing, uh, soil inspection, water inspection, electrical, they all have different forms or web maps that need to be open. So the type of data that you're collecting is tied to the type of work that you're doing. With Workforce Today, like Jeff showed, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, right? But uh, what I'm showing you here is a, a, a development build that we have of Workforce. And this is that same app integration screen that I showed before, but you can see that I've got a couple of different things here and I've got some things configured for it. Um, I've got a survey set up and a collector web map already. But I'm going to go and choose Add. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to go and choose my Road Crossings Collector. Uh, and instead of there just being a Done, I've got Next. Now I'm presented with the option to either set this web map up at the project level, so it would apply to all assignments in my project, or at the type level. So for the particular type of work that I'm performing, right, the web map will open specifically for that. So this one's for Road Crossings. And then I'll click Done, and you'll see that it's spinning away. Now what I've got here is I've got two collector web maps set up for my project. So if I head over to my Android phone here, there we go. Uh, if I go and open up road crossings, you'll see that um, uh, it doesn't show up because I know I didn't do that. If I go and open up my valve inspections, you see I've got navigate to assignment because that applies to all my projects. But I've also got survey at assignment. But if I head back to my list and I go and open up my one call tickets, you can see that for this particular type of work, I've got collected assignments set up. So it's a little bit of an odd concept if you haven't used Workforce yet, if you haven't used the integrations, but the main point to take away is that we're letting you specify the type of work that's being done can be tied to the type of work that needs to be collected, right? And that building inspections is a really good example of that. Um, so you done? that's done. That's the, that's the really what's coming. Uh, in our next release, and that's going to be available towards the end of the month um, with our Enterprise 10.5 solution and also available online. Wow, that's the quickest demo I think I've ever seen you it do. It was pretty fast. That was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's just one last thing before um, I take TC's question. And I mentioned we wanted at the very start that we want to 
We're looking to transform workforce to open it up to a bunch of new types of use. And so the theme that we've been talking about is uh, operational efficiency. The theme that um, we want to work on next is about worker safety. So if this is of interest to you, uh, I just want to highlight what our uh, five key mission statements are for uh, this transformation. And I'm just going to read them, so bear with me. I'm going to read the slide and see if it resonates with you. The first one, which we kind of do already today, monitor the ongoing safety of employees by tracking where they are and knowing where they've been. That's mission number one. We can almost check that off like we've done it. Uh, number two, improve safety awareness of mobile workers by sending alerts relative to their location. That's a new concept. Confirming the safety of mobile workers by requesting that they check in and respond with situational information. Providing employees with the ability to request help when they're in trouble and need assistance. Kind of like a panic button inside of workforce. And finally, a long-winded run-on statement that Craig made uh, is notify employees with location-specific information when they enter, exit, or dwell too long within geofenced or controlled areas. So all of those are key concepts around the notion of worker safety that we want to take workforce into. And that'll change a number of things. Um, that means that workforce could be used uh, standalone for the purpose of workforce safety and not for operational efficiency. There wouldn't actually be work assignments as part of um, the workforce product in that context. You could add on the capability of improving efficiency for workers. So it's a transformation for workforce that we're uh, just about to embark on. Uh, you're the first to hear it. Um, and uh, we're going to time bind this to hopefully have something that gonna, we can do you show. Say the time? We're going to hopefully we can show at the users conference and who knows when we'll release it. I won't get to that. But uh, the intent is that uh, as we work on those improvements to efficiency, we're also going to add all of this as a new capability to workforce. Um, so is there folks in the room that find this of interest as a, a need within their organization that they, all right, quite a few of you. Great to hear. So we will be looking for those use cases, those, um, those customers that we can work with as early adopters. Uh, so one of the best ways to contact us about that, since we've kind of run out of time, there is an, if you haven't uh, noticed it already, there is an alias. It's actually embedded, I think, in the application as well. It's called a workforce with a number four. <laughs> it's actually jshaner at <laughs> esri.com. But no one, no one with that name responds to emails. Actually, I do. As TC, I can kind of attest to. Let me just put it up uh, really quick, uh, because then it, it gets broadcast to a number of people on the team. Um, Workforce for ArcGIS at Esri.com. Can you make the font smaller for the people in the back? I don't know if you can see that or not. If you can't see it, then come up and kick Craig. I, I, and I would pay for that, actually. If you I tested this in Explorer and people do respond. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. All right, well, um, with that, uh, I guess we should just let you all go. If you have any specific questions, uh, come on up. So thank you for, for coming today, staying with us. Come serving, come serving, come serving, come serving.